Hello and welcome. You found the Social Work Podcast. My name is Jonathan Singer, and I'll be your host as we explore all things social work. Today's episode of the Social Work Podcast is about cognitive enhancement therapy, a relatively new approach to addressing some of the most persistent and intractable problems faced by people with schizophrenia. Here's how we typically think of schizophrenia. It's a severe brain disorder which may result in some combination of hallucinations, delusions, and extremely disordered thinking and behavior. We talk about positive symptoms, that's the presence of sensations, such as hallucinations, uh, beliefs like delusions, and behaviors that wouldn't normally occur. We also talk about negative symptoms, and these are the lack of abilities, lack of energy, or difficulty engaging in social activities, uh, poor motivation, difficulty making friends, um, or functioning in psychosocial contexts. Now, traditional treatments have targeted the positive and negative symptoms, but even when the hallucinations and delusions are being managed, oftentimes by medication, and people have opportunities and supports to engage in social activities, some people with schizophrenia continue to have problems acting wisely and appropriately in social situations. So why aren't people with schizophrenia getting better? Well, today's guest, Sean Eek, suggests that a third group of symptoms, cognitive symptoms, has largely been ignored by treatments. And he makes the very important point that if you can improve cognitions in people early on in the course of schizophrenia, you increase the likelihood that they'll be able to be gainfully employed, live independently, and have successful interpersonal relationships. Recognizing the power of addressing cognitive and social skills deficits, social work researcher Jerry Hogarty developed cognitive enhancement therapy in the late 90s. In order to learn more about CET, I spoke with Sean Eek. Now, you might remember Sean from episode 45. We talked about schizophrenia and social work. At the end of the conversation, he mentioned this new psychosocial intervention he'd been working on, cognitive enhancement therapy. At the time, I really wanted Sean to talk more about CET, but he was a doctoral student finishing up his PhD and didn't feel quite ready to be the voice of CET. Well, seven years later, Sean's done some incredible, groundbreaking research on CET and is considered one of the leading experts in the world. He's published over 70 peer-reviewed journal articles in the top journals in social work, psychiatry, and psychology. In 2013, he co-authored the SAGE publication text, Mental Health Case Management, A Practical Guide, with Carol Anderson and Katie Greeno. And today, he's the David E. Epperson Associate Professor of Social Work and Psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh and the director of the ASCEND program. And ASCEND stands for Advanced Support and Cognitive Enhancement for Neurodevelopmental Disorders. I spoke with Sean in New Orleans at the 2015 Society for Social Work and Research Conference. In between trips to Café du Monde to eat beignets and drink café au lait, Sean and I managed to have a fascinating conversation about the development of CET, the computer exercises and group therapy. These are the two components of the treatment. Some of the research findings that, quite frankly, blew my mind. And we ended with information on how social workers can get trained in CET. Now, a quick note about our interview. About nine minutes into the conversation, Sean's talking about the development of CET. And I call it version one. Well, Sean politely ignores me and continues talking. After I turned off the tape, Sean let me know that there is only one version of CET that's been evaluated in treatment studies. So it was a little misleading for me to say version one, because as of this time, there is no version two. So just be aware of that when you hear that segment of the interview. And now, without further ado, on to episode 98 of the Social Work Podcast, Cognitive Enhancement Therapy for Schizophrenia, an interview with Sean Eek. 
Sean, thanks so much for being here on the Social Work Podcast and talking with us about cognitive enhancement therapy. So what's the idea behind cognitive enhancement therapy? Well, cognitive enhancement therapy, as it was originally developed uh, for people with schizophrenia, uh, is really designed to address an important unmet therapeutic need. One of the challenges that people in the field have observed is that even after individuals are able to get a good response from the medicine they're taking and also uh, get good supports in order to help get them back on track uh, in terms of their lives after a hospitalization, they still are having a lot of trouble building a good quality of life and building a fuller recovery. And of course, we all thought for many, many years that, well, if you take your medicine and we get you good social work help, uh, help broker resources to you, you know, you should be able to get back on the horse and be all better. Right, because it's just, it's just the fact that you're having these hallucinations. That's the problem. And if you don't have them, then you'll be fine. That, that was the idea. I mean, that's the prevailing view for kind of like the last hundred years of schizophrenia. And, but many of, many of the people who have schizophrenia beg to differ. Uh, so, of course, medicines carry with them some challenges as well, but in addition, um, even people who faithfully take them can manage the side effects and get a good response still have trouble making friends. They still have trouble holding information in their mind uh, in order to complete a task, something as simple as remembering a phone number to you know, dial a friend, so on and so forth, or even keeping up with the um, flow of information that's going on in an interview or a back and forth conversation. Very, very difficult for people with schizophrenia. And these challenges, of course, are heightened when people are in the acute phase of the illness and psychotic. Uh, but sadly, they don't go away when the positive symptoms, when the psychotic symptoms go away. At the moment, there isn't really any good treatments available uh, in terms of um, medication treatments uh, for people with schizophrenia, in terms of treating these types of challenges. And these challenges, as I'm talking about, I haven't actually used the term yet, uh, are often referred to as cognitive problems. Sometimes they're called cognitive deficits. Sometimes they're called cognitive impairments. Um, I, I like to refer to them as more of challenges. Uh, but in general, people with schizophrenia are left with reduced psychotic symptoms but a lot of difficulty in understanding the world and processing that information. We think a lot of that is due to around the time schizophrenia develops. You know, it develops kind of late adolescence, early adulthood. A lot of important things are coming online in terms of cognition at that point. And then, boom, here comes this condition. Kind of hits people hard, knocks them off their horse. And what's left after individuals have become stabilized are really some of these difficulties in thinking or cognition. So you're saying that you have somebody who, let's say, up until the age of 14, he was fine. And then maybe some symptoms. And then by you know early 20s, had what we consider, or he, he met criteria for full-blown schizophrenia, was on medication. These positive symptoms were, were reduced. Would this have been a kid that would have been able to handle those social situations prior to schizophrenia? Or are these kids that always had challenges in those areas? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I think the jury's still out, uh, so I couldn't give you a definite answer, as most things we can't. Uh, but the, the weight of the evidence seems to suggest that these cognitive challenges come on far before somebody has a full-blown episode of schizophrenia. And in fact, if you test their siblings or even their, their parents uh, or children, you will see an inkling of the cognitive challenges that an individual with schizophrenia lives with in their family. Uh, so that's interesting. So that these cognitive symptoms are not necessarily um, the result of schizophrenia, but maybe an exacerbation yeah, what the field has generally thought of is um, they're kind of early markers of schizophrenia. Of course, they're early markers for a lot of different conditions, too, so they're not at all specific. Uh, but what we know is for people who develop this condition, they have these challenges oftentimes, uh, although maybe not to the same degree as when they become fully ill, uh, but they have at least a hint of these challenges many times before they become ill. And then after they become ill, and it becomes quite horrific and people have a lot of difficulty. And then once they become stabilized, these challenges, they're just so darn persistent. 
okay, so this has been known about people with schizophrenia for like a hundred years. So what what got you interested in this particular part of schizophrenia? What got us interested in it uh, and what got uh, the developer of cognitive enhancement therapy interested in it, uh, one of our own, uh, Jerry Hogarty, not only um, uh, was the persistence of these symptoms intriguing, uh, but what really hooked us and what I think really hooked Jerry uh, was the fact that these symptoms will predict how well you will do when you leave the hospital even better than the cardinal positive or psychotic symptoms. Really? Yeah, exa- that's what I said. Uh, it's just amazing. Now, there has been many, many studies, probably over 100 now, demonstrating this effect. Uh, and, and so when you say predicting better outcomes, what, what outcomes are you talking about? So pick an outcome you care about as a social worker. Cognition is related to it. Employment, social behavior, ability to make friends, getting along with your family. All of these have been studied. M- medication adherence? Medication adherence, absolutely. In fact, there's a there's an excellent program. Maybe you could do a podcast on Don Veligan's program, uh, Cognitive Adaptation Therapy, which is designed solely to address these cognitive problems to improve medication adherence. The impetus uh, really arose by just the degree of um, magnitude that these impairments had on people's ability to recover and function once they left the hospital, which is, of course the largest share of people with schizophrenia as the hospitals have closed and become mostly acute care centers. Now, so if you're keeping up with me, Jonathan, uh, we've got two problems here now. We've got the strongest predictor we know of, of functional outcome when people leave the hospital and we don't have a medicine to treat it. Enter cognitive enhancement therapy. That was the situation that Professor Hogarty encountered and was trying to address when he developed cognitive enhancement therapy. So how do you enhance cognitions? Well, there's, of course, a lot of ways you can enhance thinking and enhance cognition. What Jerry did, he looked into a literature on traumatic brain injury. It's a separate field than schizophrenia. It's generally not even considered in part of mental health or psychiatry by some people. Uh, But people who have a traumatic brain injury can have very serious cognitive impairment. And there was an, an outfit uh, at New York University, uh, led by Yehuda ben that was very successfully improving people's cognitive abilities who have had focal brain damage. A- and the way they were doing this... Wait, let me ask, what's focal brain damage? Uh-huh. So uh, people that have had a localized lesion, perhaps due to a stroke, usually if you have gross brain damage, you, you probably wouldn't survive. Um, so individuals that had fallen off a motorcycle and gotten a uh, head injury or individuals that had had a stroke and part of their brain had died, these were the things that Ben Yashe was treating I- initially with computer exercises. Uh, So in in traumatic brain injury, uh, the way they had been treating and and improving people's cognition was, we'll give you computer exercises that are designed to challenge the areas that you're having difficulty in with cognition. And if we can both teach you to practice that over and over again, uh, what we call drill and practice in cognitive enhancement therapy, and at the same time, teach you how to approach solving cognitive problems strategically, knowing your own strengths and challenges, perhaps we could improve that at a very substantial level. And, of course, they were doing that in traumatic brain injury. There was no reason to suggest it couldn't be tried and possibly fruitful with people with schizophrenia. They have many of the same cognitive impairments people with traumatic brain injury have. The first sort of iteration of cognitive enhancement therapy was taking this work that had developed out of traumatic brain injury and adapting it for and making it useful to people with schizophrenia. So version one was computer games. And another really important part to CET, uh, which was a group. So in order to explain why we do these two things, I have to tell you a little bit about the nature of the cognitive challenges people with schizophrenia have. So they have broadly difficulty in two domains. One is processing basic information. That is difficulty in attending to information, remembering it, and solving problems with it. Okay? We call that a neurocognitive deficit. Okay? Uh, don't let these terms fool you. All of these challenges are in the brain, uh, but this one is called a neurocognitive deficit. 
that is not the only challenge, unfortunately, people with schizophrenia have. Uh, the other challenge, as we started discussing when we started this interview, is a difficulty in understanding other people, in getting along with others, in knowing how to act wisely in interpersonal situations. Uh, something that all of us could use a little help with. Uh, and this is an area that is kind of a new topic uh, called social cognition. Okay, uh, And this is, turns out, also very problematic in schizophrenia and an area that is, is primed for targeting in terms of improving some of the outcomes that we are all interested in as social workers. So the first area, problem solving, you can do that by yourself. But that second one, social skills, that is inherently a two-person job or more. At, at least, at least. Uh, and, and is that why there's the computer game and the group? That's right. That's right. So to, to us, and I think to Jerry, his vision for cognitive enhancement therapy was that the basic problems in neurocognition people with schizophrenia had were really addressing those were really a means to an end to improving social cognition, uh, which wouldn't improve all by itself. But, you know, if you can't pay attention, it's really hard to pick up a social cue, right? If, if you can't uh, remember what's going on in a conversation, it's really hard to get the gist out of the conversation and follow and contribute, right? And so the idea was that these things would work synergistically. Uh, and so that's actually why in cognitive enhancement therapy, we don't have a do-it-yourself version of the computer work, of the neurocognitive training. Uh, actually, participants... Well, there's a lot of reasons we do this, but participants actually do the computer work together in pairs and with the help of what we call a coach. A coach would be what, what you would consider as your traditional therapist, uh, but we've called them coaches and referred to people as coaches who provide CET because the role is a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's more guided. It's more hands-off. It gives people the opportunity to be challenged uh, without rescuing them because what we've seen over and over again is in schizophrenia, if you give people the opportunity to be challenged, they will surprise you and are capable of much more than people often give them credit for. So my characterization of somebody sitting in a chair and, and problem solving on their own uh, really doesn't fit what you're talking about in terms of working on these problem solving skills. You really see that also as something that's done in relationship. We do. We think that's the best way to practice it if we're ever going to move this social cognitive challenge that people have. So working on these games, these computer exercises, they're hardly games. And uh, the younger and younger people who come in always laugh when they first see them. And we have to let them know they're oldie but goodies, right? And when you say younger, you mean the, the people with schizophrenia, not the coaches or... Yes, yes, yeah. that's that, that's right. Uh, so, although some of the coaches raise an eyebrow too, uh, but that's not allowed in my program. Uh, so, these games, they're more like exercises. And it's a lot like going to the gym, except for it's going to the gym for your brain. And who goes to the gym more often, either by themselves or with their buddy, right? So, if you have a buddy spearing you and if you have a personal trainer as well, you're likely to do that more and more often. You're likely to put a lot of effort into it. Sometimes you're likely to even compete a little uh, and push yourself maybe further than you would have. This is kind of like what we do in CET uh, in, in terms of computer training. What are some of the effects that you found for people that are doing these exercises? I won't call them games, but these computer exercises. Sure. Well, it's an interesting question that you ask because CET is an integrated program. You know, it contains two parts which occur simultaneously, the computer training, neurocognitive training, and the social cognitive training. Uh, we're not able to isolate the effects of just doing the computer work uh, or just doing the group, the social cognitive groups. But the effects that we've seen when we put these two together have been pretty remarkable. The first study uh, was published in 2004 uh, with 121 people with schizophrenia who'd been ill for many years, on average about 15 years. Uh, and the level of improvement uh, that was seen in terms of basic neurocognitive ability was, I think it was two or three times the best medication effect that had been observed. So on average, medications improve, co antipsychotic medications improve cognition about 0.2 standard deviations, okay? What does that mean? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Two-tenths of a standard deviation uh, is, you know, there's, there's the average level of cognitive ability among people with schizophrenia, which falls at about 
one full standard deviation below people who do not have schizophrenia. Okay, so if you move up two tenths of a point, you're not very close to a full point. Uh, that is to what we would consider uh, people's ability if they didn't have this condition. So the average effect of CET on that first study was over a standard deviation. So not only were we able to improve individuals to a level that we hope perhaps was as good as before they got the illness or before they perhaps deteriorated, but we were maybe even able to teach them new skills that enabled them to do even better than that. And as the studies go on, CET gets a little bit more refined every time. We, we get better at knowing how to do it and what should stay in and what shouldn't. And so it was um, streamlined a little bit after that first study. And we started a second study uh, with individuals in the early course of schizophrenia, the idea being if we can improve outcomes among people who've been ill for so long, why should we wait 15 years to give it to them? What was interesting in that study uh, was... When you treat individuals who are young, who have this condition, when you get to them early, there's all these barriers that are, that are removed in terms of them getting better. Uh, so for example, uh, individuals who've been ill for a very long time are oftentimes on the disability system. Uh, I think almost 100% of our sample was involved in the disability symptom, system, excuse me, and there was a lot of in disincentives uh, for going to work if you're in that system. But these young individuals we see were on mom and dad's insurance. They weren't entrenched in either a mental health or a disability system yet. And that was kind of part of the idea also with this early course study. And at the end of that study, we were happy to report not only was cognition improved, uh, but these young individuals were going back to work and going back to school. I mean, one, one of the follow-up interviews that I did when I was a student working for Jerry on this uh, project uh, was uh, we followed individuals after they had completed treatment and a year later asked how they were doing. And one individual sticks particularly in my mind. Uh, um, he, he, he said, things are great. I just got back from my honeymoon. And me, uh, this, this was some time ago when this study was conducted. I was I still am fairly wet behind the ears, but I was particularly wet behind the ears then. I'd never seen someone with schizophrenia get married and go on a honeymoon. This was amazing. And I thought, this, we've really got something here. Jerry was really on to something. Uh, sadly, he passed away before that study ended. And I, myself and his colleague, Matt Sherry had to con had to complete it. Uh, and we were so glad that we could, though, uh, because we, after seeing how well people did in this intervention, we, we, we knew we had something uh, that could really help these individuals. So there's an intervention that uses computer games. It uses a group setting. You've talked about the computer games. What does the group do? I'm glad you ask, uh, because in CET, the computer work is important, but it's, as I said before, it's not really the heart of the program. The heart of the program is the group. And the group setting is, is what Professor Hogarty always referred to as secondary socialization, kind of, uh, which I thought was an interesting concept. It, it comes out of sociology. Broadly, the idea is that you learn best by both interacting with others and observing people do well and succeed in a safe environment where you can have the opportunity to mess up and nobody's going to get on your case about it, and we're just going to give you an opportunity to do better next time. And so the groups are structured around that philosophy. The content is all about social cognition, and there's 45 group sessions. They're very structured. It's a lot more like a class than it is a therapy. We always talk about social cognition, recovery, and the functional outcomes that the people who participate are really most interested in. So are there 45 different topics that are covered? There are. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yep. It's, um, it's a big program. It's comprehensive in nature. There are 45 topics. They range from learning how to take the perspective of other people to getting the gist out of conversations to something we call emotional temperature taking, picking up nonverbal cues, reading facial expressions of emotions. 
it's broken up into a variety of modules. The third module in CET is dedicated entirely to application. And one of the exercises in it I love, I don't think our group members love it when they first start, but when they get good at it, they do, uh, is using CET to help a friend where they actually have to teach CET to somebody else who's having a problem that has, um, it, it's of course a, so, a social problem uh, that has unique opportunities to use the CET strategies that they've learned throughout the group. These 45 different topics, are these things that Jerry came up with, that you came up with? Is this standard treatment in traumatic brain? Like, like where, where does this information come from? Well, I, I can make, take no credit for the design of any of these sessions. Pro- Professor Hogarty developed the lion's share of it. Um, but what you see is the early sessions really build on his previous treatments. They include a lot from personal therapy and from family psychoeducation, and even from the er- earliest Thorazine studies that he conducted back in the 50s or 60s. Oh, boy, I probably got the date wrong. Uh, so... <laughs> They really give people a solid base of understanding their condition, the role medicine has to play in it, the limitations on it, and uh, other things that sh- would be helpful, like psychosocial treatment, um, stress management. Those things are what the first couple of sessions in CET addresses. So you can see they're not squarely on social cognition. They're really laying the foundation on this. Uh, and we do that, and I think Jerry structured it that way because we see so many people who haven't gotten that already. We see many people who don't even know what their condition is uh, and what, what the thing is that's been giving them trouble for so long. Uh, and so that part of the work came from his early developments in treatment. The rest of it, I think he in- was inspired almost entirely by his own creativity. So, I mean, Jerry read a lot. If he was alive today, I don't think he would let me say that. Uh, I think he would give a lot of credit to most, a lot of other people that have written on this. One in particular that I should mention, uh, people might be interested, Selman wrote a book called Making a Friend in Youth. Selman was like a developmental sociologist, furthest thing from schizophrenia you could ever think of. Uh, So Jerry's reading this book and reading this book, he's like, you know, this is what we need to teach the people that we work with. This is about how to develop friends and improve social cognition. This is how we should structure our curriculum. So I think he was inspired by so many people who'd worked hard in this field, but he really put it into practice. I mean, I could almost imagine everybody benefiting from this kind of group. I mean, we all have our own social skills deficit. I know my wife would tell me I have deficits in certain social skills areas. Um, Mine as well. (laughs) Um, have you ever had students or coaches come in and say, man, I learned something today? Absolutely. All of us have admitted that CET has been beneficial to provide, uh, as well as receive. Jerry always said to me when I was his student, never develop a treatment you don't think would be beneficial for yourself. CET, I think really fits in that regard a lot. To give you some idea of the broad applicability of CET though, We've taken it to more than just schizophrenia now. There's a lot of groups of individuals that suffer particularly from these social challenges that we talk about. And one condition that is very similar in terms of the social challenges people experience is autism spectrum disorder. Uh, Many people don't know. uh, Of course, family members who have a child with autism would know. But many practitioners don't know that there's not really any evidence-based treatments for adults with autism and very, very few treatments for autism that target social cognition. And so we've begun the first set of studies adapting cognitive enhancement therapy to adults with autism spectrum disorder with really great success. The studies are still ongoing, uh, and so I can't really report on the findings yet, but the people are that, that come to the groups and are participating in the program they stay, they do well, they enjoy it, and we see real important movement in individuals. Uh, there's lots of anecdotes I could give you, uh, but I'll wait for the scientific papers to come out instead. And after they come out, we'll do an interview about CET for people with autism. Wonderful. <laughs> so is there any hard data that you have about CET and the effectiveness? Well, I always thought the employment data was hard data. 
personally. But I understand what you mean by hard data. There's a, you know, other people have different perspectives on what they think is convincing evidence. Well, and with employment, I'll just throw out, I mean, I could hear, you know, a skeptic say, well, yeah, I mean, there's some people that would get a job because they got a cousin who would give them a job. And if you got 127 people and 10 people have a parent that's going to give them a job, it's going to throw off your data. I want something that isn't going to be influenced by daddy wanting to give, you know, Johnny a job. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, so the, uh, of course, the employment data weren't characterized like that. Okay. All, all of the jobs people got were real jobs for real money. Uh, not, not to diminish it, of course not, no. <laughs> I, I understand ex exactly what you mean. So we have a program that's designed to improve thinking and cognition. If there's any credibility to this program, the hard data should lie in what's happening to the brain. We've now published the first study showing that a social work intervention, a non-drug social work intervention, can protect against brain tissue loss in schizophrenia. In 2010, we did an analysis of these young individuals who went through CET and showed that unlike people who didn't receive CET, who um, displayed what is typical in the early phase of schizophrenia, which is a progressive loss of brain tissue, gray matter, in areas of the brain that were particularly associated with understanding and thinking about other people. People who received CET showed no such loss. Exactly what we were trying to target. And what was so fascinating about that was not only was there this interesting, what we termed a neuroprotective effect, but the protection against that loss was directly related to their social and cognitive improvements. So we have now really hard data. Now, we don't know what all that means. I mean, if you, if you asked a neuroscientist, is bigger better, smaller better? I mean, it really depends on a lot of things. Uh, and I won't uh, claim to be an expert on any of that. What we do know is that there is a signal in the brain and that that signal is related to improved outcomes. And of course, we now have another study that's ongoing to really investigate. What does that signal mean? Perhaps the brain in schizophrenia is far more plastic, far more amenable to treatment. Perhaps it's not as damaged as people might think and could be shaped and improved by psychosocial, environmental, and hopefully one day pharmacological interventions. I spoke with Larry Steinberg, developmental psychologist, and that was one of the things that he talked about over and over again, particularly for the adolescent brain. You know, adolescent brain being up to 25, right, about the plasticity, how malleable it was. And hearing you talk about this, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about folks with, you know, in the early stages, they, their brains are in that under 25 age range, right? Absolutely. absolutely. And, and of course, you may recall, schizophrenia used to be considered a static encephaly, right? Th that is a brain damage that is not changing, at least not for the better. And so our hope is that as people do these studies, and as, as we help have our minor contribution to that area, that people will have a renewed optimism and hope for what's possible in schizophrenia and stop thinking of it as a, a brain disorder that has to be static. It's a, it is a brain condition, but it seems like it's something that we can really move. This is great, Sean. I mean, you know, when we think about social work and the impact that we have, it's hard for practitioners to say research is directly applicable to what I do. But what you're saying is that people in the early stages of schizophrenia and people been diagnosed for many years, responded incredibly well. And at the end of the day, that is what social workers want. They want their clients to respond well. Absolutely. Uh, and, and the social workers we've trained to provide CET, they always enjoy the process of providing treatment. But what they really enjoy the most is seeing the people that they work with who have these conditions really improve. Uh, you know, not everybody improves to the same degree. Everybody is on their own journey in terms of their recovery, uh, but they see sides of the people they work with they've never seen before. And I did, just like with this individual who came back from the honeymoon. And that makes it so rewarding and really, I think, brings it home to practitioners that are really interested in making a difference for their patients. So you mentioned training social workers. If I were listening to this podcast and I worked with people with schizophrenia and I thought, hey, I'm going to get some of that CET 
in my agency. How could I do that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So uh, I'm pleased to report that cognitive enhancement therapy was recently approved by SAMHSA uh, as an evidence-based practice. Uh, Congratulations. That is huge. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was quite a review process. And that opened, I think, a lot of doors to possibility of reimbursement. People have been happy to pay for it. Uh, in terms of training, there is a comprehensive manual available. We offer some training. Of course, this isn't the main thing that we do, so we can only take on so many requests, but we're building up training centers so that they can respond to the interest and the need that's out there in the community. And when you say we, who's who's we? There's a side uh, business that is run by Professor Hogarty's wife, who's also a psychiatric clinical nurse specialist, uh, Susan Hogarty, and a longtime colleague of his, Deborah Greenwald. It's called CET Training LLC, and people who want training go to usually our website, cognitiveenhancementtherapy.com, and they contact Dr. Greenwald or Mrs. Hogarty and either obtain the manual or or work on obtaining in-person training. And so the manual is available through the website? It is, yes, yes. You can get it through the website. It's um, modestly priced. Uh, This is... uh, work that we're not trying to profit off of. It was funded by public taxpayer dollars, uh, and so we would like it to be available to as many people as possible, uh, because that's our hope. Well, Sean, thanks so much for spending the time to talk with us about cognitive enhancement therapy. It's inspiring. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm Jonathan Singer, and thanks for being with me today for another episode of the Social Work Podcast. If you missed an episode or have suggestions for future episodes, please visit socialworkpodcast.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit our online store at cafepress.com slash swpodcast. To all the social workers out there, keep up the good work. We'll see you next time at the Social Work Podcast.